let's talk about you. So I want to preface this whole thing by saying I already recorded this whole video and then I took my SD card to my computer and plugged it in and I recorded this video in two parts and one of them corrupted. I want to give a little bit of backstory of myself with this series. So I first heard about you around the tail end of the hype of season one. And I was really skeptical about it because it seemed like one of those shows that people would be really obsessed with for like six months and then forget ever existed in like a year or two. Also, I didn't really know the premise, so I thought it was just like a romantic comedy kind of show. Definitely not a romantic comedy. So it wasn't until about the tail end of the hype of season two that I kind of got into it. So around the time that season three was already announced and kind of in production. And by that, what I really mean is it was during the height of the pandemic. My jumping into the show was just me trying to be kind of escapist because not only was I living in the world of the pandemic, I was also still working full time. My job really did not change at all even though we were in a pandemic. 16 hour overnight shifts, super fun time. So I was really just looking for a show that I could watch just to sort of forget my existence. And I had seen a lot of memes for you and they intrigued me. Most of the memes had to do with the cage and I'm like, this does not sound like the show that I thought it was. I will watch the first episode and if I like it, then I will keep watching and if I hate it, then you know, no harm, no foul. And I ended up watching the whole season within like a week. RIP that sleep schedule. So at the time I had no interest really in reading the book because the show was just, it was enough for me. But then I started learning more about the differences between the book and the show. And so I was intrigued. So I finally got around to, you know, reading the book, Hello Cinnamon. Don't, don't eat the book, please. Specifically, I listened to the audiobook, which I'm not usually a huge audiobook person. I struggle sometimes with like following stories through audio. So would I recommend this book? If you prefer to read before watching a show or movie adaptation, absolutely. There's some kind of, I think, mostly obvious content warnings that come with this book. Stalking is like the entire premise of the book, honestly. There's some drug use, there's sexual harassment and generalized misconduct. Murder is also, you know, a pretty major point of the book. So if those things are issues for you, um, this probably isn't the book for you, but if you're okay with all of those components in a book, then absolutely fine. As far as recommending this book, I think it was a very interesting read. I don't want to say enjoyable, like it feels weird to say enjoyable, like this man stalks and murders people. I absolutely recommend reading this book, it's so fun, like that feels weird. I will say the audiobook really took this narrative to the next level. There are definitely points where I felt really uncomfortable and the voice actor that did the audiobook really heightened that feeling of just uncomfortable, somewhat disgust. So all that said, before I jump too much into spoilers, I do want to talk about some of the key differences that I noticed between the show and the book. So this section of the video, I'm gonna say, is going to be very minor spoilers, so if you don't want to know much of anything going into the story, um, don't watch this part, but also, but I'm not gonna give away like major plot points, so that's your warning. We're gonna talk a little bit about the differences between the show and the book. I think the most dramatic difference between the book and the show is the way that Joe is presented, and I think part of that has to do with Penn Badgley as the actor for Joe in the show, and the fact that we aren't necessarily directly in his head all the time, like we don't always have that sort of narration, whereas in the book it's told in the first person, so we're just constantly in Joe's head. I'll say right off the bat, I didn't really like Joe in the book just because he seemed kind of pretentious, and I'm not a fan of literary elitism, just in general, and for how much of a dick Joe was being about, like, Dan Brown, I've never read a Dan Brown book, but for how much of a dick Joe was being about it, I already don't like you. But I think it's most apparent when Joe murders. So in the show, we don't always get that up-close personal 
thought pattern of Joe as he is murdering or immediately after. A lot of that is conveyed in the actions and expressions of Penn Badgley. And the way that it's presented specifically in the first season, it almost feels like a lot of the murders are not intended. Like the face that kind of comes out after a murder has happened. It's almost like he's all of a sudden realizing what he's just done. There's this sense of regret and a realization that what just happened shouldn't have happened. And like even though you know none of the murders are accidental, he makes them feel like that was never his intention, you know? He didn't mean to kill anyone. And that is so not how it's presented in the book. In the book, there is none of that remorse, there is none of that confusion, there is none of that oopsie daisy. I want to say that the first death was legitimately an accident, like he didn't mean to kill that particular person with the timing that he had, but he did not regret it at all. And I think that's a really interesting distinction. Specifically in the show, and especially in that first season, it makes Joe's murders almost feel forgivable because they weren't, they weren't intended and they were done with good intentions, if you could say that. Whereas in the book, it feels a lot more obvious that Joe is trying to basically control Beck's environment. Beck being, of course, the love interest. And I think that also comes through a lot more in his thoughts. He makes a lot of assumptions about everybody honestly, but especially Beck and her character. There's a lot of description just in the first chapter about how he's interpreting her and how right off the bat she's being flirtatious with him and she must be into him, which is part of how he justifies his obsession with her, which we get that in the show as well. I think just in general, also having a face attached to Joe and it doesn't hurt that the actor himself is physically attractive really makes it a lot easier to forgive how toxic of an individual he is. The other significant difference between the book and the show is Paco. Really the whole neighbor situation. Um, Claudia and I don't even remember the husband's name. They don't exist in the book. So in the show, the existence of Paco really helped to round out Joe's character because in the show we're able to see Joe as kind of this caring, almost parental figure. He's very protective. He provides a lot of reprieve from the abusive home situation that Paco is experiencing. And so I feel like that also makes it a lot easier to sympathize with and actually like Joe's character. Keep in mind that the show was produced by Lifetime, so that's part of what they want. They want you to fall in love with that main love interest character. And honestly, the show is done so, so well, because even seeing how toxic of an individual he is, I couldn't help but root for him through the entire first like three seasons. In the book, Paco doesn't exist. Um, there's not really any child that he cares for. And so I think that does take away some of that likability of his character, which I think is good because he's not a character that we should like. He should not be a likable character. So I'm glad that there's a little bit more emotional distance that we can build within the book. That said, had I not watched the series and have already been invested in the characters, I probably wouldn't have liked the book as much because of this fact, because he's not nearly as likable in the book as he's in the show. Can we just talk for a minute about how easily it is to root for Joe, especially in the show? I don't know what it is about being a woman and just being attracted to the most toxic male characters out there. I know I'm not the only one. And I know that I did not get into this character as much as some people did. This is probably a problem that needs to be addressed. With that, there were some relationships that are shuffled a little bit. Specifically, Karen Minty, which I'm not going to go into too deeply, but in the show there is a point at which the neighbor woman is clearly on drugs and needs to get clean. And we see Joe help in that situation. But that situation does not exist in the book, which is yet another case of the show really helped to emphasize Joe as somewhat of a likable character in a way that the book does not. I will say I found really interesting that there were a lot of things that stayed exactly the same from the book to the television show. Like Joe as a character is an absolute creep. The stalking and just the sexual perversion. And they keep some of that from the book in the show, but it's presented almost in a way that it doesn't 
feel as disgusting. Part of me really just wants to sit down and just hyper analyze everything from both the show and the book and nobody's got time for that right now. This is really just a quick book talk and by quick book talk I mean I have been talking for about two hours in total if we include the uh, corrupted file. I think I've talked about everything that was on that corrupted video so with that I would like to now jump into the heavy spoilery section so if you have not read this book yet, if you have not seen the show yet, um, and you plan to, and you don't want to be spoiled, this is the time, this is your final warning, because um, we're gonna dive much deeper into you. <laughs> There's no way to say that without that sounding weird. Okay. Throughout the story, Jill makes a lot of assumptions about the characters around them and what they're doing and why they're doing the things that they're doing. Even on the first page, we get, you smile, embarrassed to be a nice girl, and your nails are bare and your v-neck sweater is beige. You're classic and compact. You don't see it, but I do. It's cracked. It's in a yellow case. This means you only take care of yourself when you're beyond redemption. I bet you take zinc on the third day of the cold. So right off the bat, he is making all kinds of assumptions about this girl, Beck, uh, who ends up being, you know, the main love interest of the book. Which, like, right away, being this close to his thoughts all of the time, I hate him. <laughs> Which, like, for me, makes it make a lot more sense that they are going to completely turn the tables on how Joe is presented in season five, supposedly, because he has been too lovable for too long on screen. Anyway, so Joe runs this bookstore, Mooney's, which is owned by Mr. Mooney, um, who we later find out that Joe was originally pretty much raised by Mr. Mooney. But he meets Guinevere Beck in the bookstore one random Tuesday at 10.06 a.m. She's buying some books. She turns out to be working on her MFA. She's a writer. She, like most writers, sucks at actually sitting down and doing the writing thing. It's such a mood, honestly. <laughs> the beginning of the book is a lot like the show in that, you know, they have that initial interaction. He is immediately obsessed with her. He manages to track her down much faster than I think you see in the show. You notice how awful some of her friends are and how inattentive they are to her. They really don't believe in her writing and it really feels less like a we're here to support you so much as a we're here to watch you fail at the open mic night. Now how much of that is just Joe sort of coloring the whole situation? hard to say. It's important to remember that Joe himself is kind of that unreliable narrator because everything's gonna be colored in the way that he wants to see it. Joe and Beck spend I feel like a lot more time together in the book than they do in the TV show, which I think is really good for just the generalized development of their relationship. And like there are points where you can kind of almost start to understand some of Joe's frustrations with Gwen because like she's into him and then she's not and then she's into him and then she's not. If you were a mentally sane individual, I feel like the best piece of advice to give him would be to just like move on because she's never going to straighten out. Because honestly, what she's doing is just being a stupid 20 something. She's trying to figure herself out. She's trying to deal with being an adult while also balancing school and being poor in New York City, which is a terrible place to be poor. Not to mention she's going through a lot of somewhat traumatic events, even outside of what Joe is doing to her. I will say I am a little upset at the use of the perverted professor trope. I just feel like personally that's an overdone trope in media, but it fit for the tone of the story. It gave Joe an opportunity to play hero in a subtle way where he was just giving her advice and that advice worked. And I think it also gave an opportunity for the audience to see that Beck wasn't just sleeping around with anybody that she could get into the bed of. She had boundaries. Benji was honestly awful. I'll say in the book and in the show, I was glad to see him gone because he was just gross. Benji was cheating on Beck, but Beck was just like, it's fine. We can still be together. And he was just really flaky to her. And I was glad to kind of see him out of the picture. And I think, again, for me, the character of Joe worked a lot better in the TV series than he did in the book. But in both cases, having Benji be kind of that first victim, I think does a really good job at making the audience sort of start to understand and maybe 
empathize with Joe's perspective. Even though, you know, murder's wrong and all of that, but like, Beck didn't need Benji in her life. We agree that he is right. We do not agree with his methods. <laughs> I almost forgot about the other major difference between the book and the TV show, which is Joe's, they're not really co-workers, more like subordinates at the bookstore. Because in the show, we have Ethan and we only ever have Ethan. Ethan's the only person that Joe works with. And they seem kind of like bros. They seem to like each other in that sort of co-worker dynamic way. In the book, Joe is so annoyed by Ethan all the time. He's just like, Ethan is way too happy and way too peppy and I cannot deal with this. But before we had Ethan, we had Curtis and Curtis was not a great employee. To be fair, this is a situation of a teenager just being a teenager and just wanting to have a job to make money so that he can buy whatever it is he's looking to buy. But when I tell you the shock it was for him to come back and be beating the crap out of Joe towards the end, it's really more towards like the middle of the story, Karen Minty. I'll be honest, Karen Minty felt like even more of a blip in the book than she did in the show. And I think a lot of it comes down to that missing of Claudia. Because in the show in particular, Karen Minty kind of presented Joe as being capable of being in a typical, somewhat healthy-ish relationship. He wasn't obsessive over her. She wasn't obsessive over him. I loved the breakup in the show and how she was just like, okay, yeah, I get it. We're done. We are adults here. I'm just gonna leave. I felt a little less comfortable about it in the book where later on Karen's brother was also a cop showed up at Joe's doorstep and just attacked him. That felt a little gross to me. It didn't work for me in quite the same way that the show did. I also kind of want to talk about the first time that Joe and Beck do the deed. So the first time that they do the deed in the TV show is in the third episode of the first season. Whereas in the book, it's pretty much exactly in the middle. It's around page 240 ish. And in the show, it's definitely a situation of like, okay, we're ready for it. You know, it's been, they've been doing this kind of back and forth for a while. Benji is more or less out of the way. There's that sort of romantic tension. Like, yes, this should be happening. First of all, it's drawn out super far in the book, which is fine. I don't love it. Um, there is definitely a weird dynamic because at this point, Beck is working at the bookstore, but she's not really working at the bookstore. And he takes her down to the cage, which is fine because Beck does see the cage in the first season, but they don't really do anything in the cage. And I don't remember because it's been a hot minute since I've seen the first season, but I feel like Joe specifically didn't want to do anything in the cage because he was concerned about the books. The fact that they end up down in the cage for the first time that they're doing the dirty felt a little weird to me. I do find interesting the spiral that Joe has after that incident because he plans to have another date with her pretty much the next night and he goes off on this tangent about candles and then she sends him a text being like sorry I have to bail and then he burns himself on the candle on purpose and then he goes off on this tangent about suicide which like <laughs> my man you need therapy <laughs> but also when he went to therapy, he didn't really do it well. <laughs> so Dr. Nikki is another situation in the story that gives me major ick. I don't personally have an issue with the fact that Beck and Dr. Nikki had a relationship. From a professional standpoint, however, Dr. Nikki should have immediately referred Beck to somebody else rather than continue to be her therapist because that's not, it's not good. Like, I don't have an issue with a therapist being presented as having their own sort of life issues. So like the fact that he was having an affair with his wife and that he had all of these family issues at home and that he clearly had problems to take care of of his own, I don't have a problem with that because therapists are people too. But the lack of professionalism and the fact that he did not immediately refer Gwen of year to somebody, anybody else and say, you know, we can have this relationship, but I cannot be your therapist anymore. That gives me the ick. And the fact that he knew what he was doing, honestly, the more I think about it, the more just all of the characters are so icky in so many ways. 
the one thing that I will say that I really appreciate about the way that the story is presented is that there are no heroes. Like Joe thinks that he's a hero and I like the way that he's written so that as an audience we can see his perspective and understand his perspective, but he's icky to the point that we can't relate and icky to the point that we understand that this is a mentally ill individual. Beck has her own slew of issues and some of them come down to just being a normal 20 something in the big city, trying to figure out who you are and what you wanna be with a messed up family life. The situation with her dad made me uncomfortable, both in the fact that she felt the need to lie about him being alive to begin with, but also the whole family situation that he moved on to and kind of made it feel like she couldn't be a part of it. And some of that might be her own interactions with the family. We don't get a super long look at the whole family situation. We just get enough to understand that it's not your typical happy-go-lucky family situation. <laughs> Peach. Peach was especially disturbing. And I feel like they made her less disturbing in the show. Like there were still the pictures and the attempt at making sexual content tat. So she was clearly still obsessive in the show, but in the show it wasn't nearly as, I'll say, aggressive. In the book, I was genuinely concerned for Beck's safety, particularly after they went for a run and they switched into robes and that scene where Peach just starts massaging Beck and Beck is clearly getting uncomfortable. And it's so hard to understand Beck and what she wants because a lot of it is colored by Joe's perspective. And so with Joe's perspective in mind, it starts to really feel like it's Beck's fault because she keeps on putting herself in these situations with these people that are trying to come at her sexually. And there are a lot of instances in which she seems to want it. But we also know from when Joe spies on Dr. Nikki's documents that she's trying to work her stuff out. Which leads to the green pillow. <laughs> Can I just say that I was really shocked when I watched the series and the green pillow was was in it and like they they went there they really went there i do think that there was kind of this missed opportunity within the show to explain what the green pillow signified like instead they went with a red ladle which i'll admit makes it feel a little bit less incestuous but also i feel like there is a point to the green pillow and the fact that she stole it. I feel like in talking about everything, I'm really putting off talking about the ending because the ending was especially disturbing. So just like in the show, Joe kidnaps Beck. So because Paco is not a part of the book world, Gwen still finds the box, um, but instead of the box being hidden in the ceiling tiles, it's actually hidden in a hole in the wall that Joe had accidentally made during one of his temper tantrums. I want to say he threw a typewriter into a wall because he had a collection of typewriters because of course he did. And so she finds this box that has all of this Beck memorabilia. And so she freaks out and rather than immediately running to get police, she decides that she wants to confront Joe, which like, first of all, honey, why would you do this? Like, get out of there. Don't don't confront him. <laughs> it's sort of like that trope in hero movies where the villain is just monologuing for so long that the hero has enough time to defeat the villain before the monologue is even finished. Like that's what, what this felt like to me. Like why, why would you confront him, honey? Have a brain. <laughs> you don't need to be so dramatic all the time. <laughs> so Joe does what he does best, which is take back to the cage, locks her in. Towards the end of the book, Beck is basically begging for her life by basically saying how terrible of a person she is. So Joe asks, what do you want now? And in his mind, the correct answer is him. And she's basically talking about how she wants to reinvent herself and she just wants to leave and she never wants to come back. And she promises that he'll never have to see her again if he just lets her go. And so he just starts choking her out until she passes out. And he thinks that he's killed her because she has gone limp and cold. And so he starts panicking because he just killed the woman that he loves. And in this time he realizes 
While she was in the cage, they were reading the Da Vinci Code together because it had been kind of an inside joke between them during the relationship and neither of them had ever read the Da Vinci Code. So they were reading it together and talking about it together. And so after he thinks that he has killed her, he looks at her copy of the Da Vinci Code and finds that there are whole sections of the book that were really still tightly together, which suggests that the book had never been opened, at least to those particular passages. And so he is overcome not only with the grief of killing her, but also in feeling that the reading of the Da Vinci Code together was like the most romantic interaction of his life and she had lied about it. And while this is happening, she comes back to consciousness and attacks him. But now he is so aggressively mad at her and she tries to get away, but he knocks her down and he starts choking her out again. She starts to say, help. And he's like, okay, I'll help you. And then he starts ripping pages out of the Da Vinci Code and stuffing them down her throat. My last words to you, open up Guinevere. I shove the pages into your mouth and your pupils slip around in your back arches. This is the sound of you dying. There are bones cracking where I do not know and tear ducts in emergency mode. The tear of death seeps out of your left eye and onto your porcelain cheek and your eyes are fixated on somewhere I have never traveled. Gladly beyond any experience, your eyes have their silence. Feels terrible to laugh about this, but he immediately starts mourning her death again just trying to visualize the situation oh no she's dead oh she's alive punch oh no she's dead like, i'm sorry i'm a terrible person it's fine it makes it really interesting to contrast again against the television show because beck's last days in the television show was her basically writing up her memoir and within that story she basically frames dr nikki for everything that joe did and she dies as a best-selling author because her story ends up being taken by blythe and published they never really had that sort of romantic connection at the end of reading a story together of experiencing that sort of inside joke together and so instead of this graphic death scene um the television show literally just faded to black, which I think was an interesting choice. It's doubly interesting to be in some of the online forums that talk about this show and, and how some people suspected that Beck might have still been alive because we didn't see her die on screen the same way that we see so many other characters die on screen. The issue, of course, is that her body was literally found and she is very, very dead. I also found particularly interesting as Beck was basically begging for her life, she talked about moving to LA and potentially becoming an actress, basically saying she was going to give up her career as a writer because she wasn't going anywhere. She didn't want to be a writer anymore. I feel like there's a real interesting parallel between that and the fact that Joe later goes to LA. I'm also really interested to know more about Amy Adams because in the TV show, Amy Adams is Candace, which was Joe's previous girlfriend who he thought he killed but didn't. In the book, Amy Adams is a legitimate separate character. I don't know if this is a situation of Candace got plastic surgery after being almost murdered or if Amy Adams is legitimately a separate character. I'm definitely confused by her presence. Joe is definitely interested in her after Beck's death, which I do appreciate that that ending is what it is. It does show that Joe operates in kind of the cycle of becoming obsessive over a particular woman. But just because Beck is dead does not mean that he is somehow miraculously healed and he's going to be a normal individual moving forward or that he's given up on love or anything of the sort. It just means that he's ready to move on to the next one. In the TV series, they presented this as Candace coming back. So I'm really interested to know if Amy Adams is Candace just unrecognizable some way, somehow. But also if so, why is she playing in the way that she is? Because she kind of shows up in the middle of the story to buy a book and they sort of flirt a little bit. And Joe's kind of interested in her, but not super interested because he's still doing this obsessive thing with Beck. But once Beck is out of the way, she comes back. So I'm really interested to know about that and just to see how the rest of the series, where those differences lie between the book and the series. Because I know as the series progresses, the Netflix series goes in a completely different direction from the books. From what little I currently know about the books, the love interest in the next book is 
so so different in the books than she is in the show so I will be interested to see. I do have a lot of books on my TBR so it's probably gonna be a while before I get to Hidden Bodies which is the second book in the series but if you want me to read it and talk about it let me know down in the comments below. Also let me know what you thought of you. It's definitely not a comfortable story. It's definitely not a comfortable narrative. It's definitely not like a feel-good piece by any stretch of the imagination. I think I said this already, but I do really appreciate that none of the characters were particularly likable and that there really was no hero because I feel like that is real life where you do have just a whole bunch of people that are honestly all kind of toxic to each other, but all to varying degrees of toxicity. And you do have some of those characters that recognize and acknowledge some of their own flaws and try to either suppress them or leverage them, which I think Beck is a great example of, especially in that sort of last monologue, which we don't even really get to hear the monologue. We just hear Joe's description of it. So yeah, let me know what you thought of you down in the comments below and what books you think I should talk about next. I have so many books on my shelves that I still need to read. While you're down there, give this video a big old thumbs up and subscribe to this channel because I post a new video every Wednesday for whatever Wednesdays. And I will see you next time.